Okay, Q&A session. There's a lady with a hand up. Ashley, are you here? Good man. Um, sixth row back. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Hi, uh, Yasmin Morgan, NHS Fife. I had a question for Dave about uh, solar for flats. I was just curious to know, how do you get all of the tenants or the owners of the flats, because it can be different, not all renters, not all owners, how do you get them all to agree and how did they all pay for it? How did that work? And how did you get them all to agree together to do the solar project? It depends if it's mixed tenure or uh, all social properties are all sold in the shell. Uh, if it's, um, we just supply the product, um, so it's down to the installer and the housing provider to take the community engagement challenge on board, but we will help in any way we can. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Other questions for the panel? Any? You just want to go, don't you? Come on, you've stayed now. It's question time. What are the things that keep you awake at night? Nicola, um, you talked about the just transition. That's something I'm bothered about because I recognise that I'm a very, very fortunate human being. I don't know what to do about it, but I admire massively what you're doing because it needs to be done. What keeps you awake at night? Do you know, I'm going to reverse that and say to you, do you know what helps me sleep at night is knowing that an individual's been helped. So if I was to think about all the barriers and think about them all every day and not finish my work till that last email's done or something, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't go. Like a lot of you, you would sit there. But what helps me finish and what helps me sleep at night is knowing that someone in their home is warmer and they can probably afford it more. Uh -huh. Right, then. so you're making a contribution. Yeah. Connor, in the same way, when people talk about squirting balls into my walls, if you'll pardon the expression, <laughs> I immediately go, oh no, that's, that, oh no, there were scandals about that, and that's, that's expensive, and it's not necessarily going to work. Am I right to be concerned about people coming around the door and saying, I want to do this thing, squirt balls in your walls? Um, so it's EPS bead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think the, I guess the first thing I'd say is like you know you talked about kind of uh, scandals or concerns there those aren't associated with with our products as of course of course so, uh, but there may but, be a perception in the yeah, marketplace sure, there, there, I think there has been um, you know a degree of bad press on on energy efficiency retrofit um, and I think if you look at the requirements that people have to go through to either become an installer of those measures or access the government funding to help contribute towards it. Um, and then the technical oversight they have after the measure is done, you know, how that is controlled and managed now is vastly, vastly different to what it would have been 10 years ago um, and, and longer. Um, some of those things are the innovation of technology to actually monitor things didn't exist, and it does now. Um, and I think uh, government has spent an awful lot of money on the compliance side of it and getting the outcomes. Um, you know, we've all sorts of, all of you probably have worked on projects now that talk about retrofit coordinators or PAS compliance. Those things only really started to come in from 2016. Um, and I think we're at the point now where I don't know how much it is on the warm work schemes, Nicola, but we're probably at the point where we're spending more on compliance than actually the installation and mm. delivery of the measures. So me personally, there's probably a bit of balancing of that fear versus mm. the likely outcome of, of success or, 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 or lack thereof, because there is a limited amount of funding that we have. Um, and clearly, if we've got 100 million and we spend 60 million of it on compliance, <laughs> There's not a whole lot of actual measures getting done with the 100 million. Um, there's probably a balance to that, but where we're at from compliance and ensuring quality outcomes now versus a decade ago is, is vastly different. I suppose that what that underlines is that within this room and on this panel, there's a huge amount of factual evidence that you bring to bear to challenge people's preconceptions, their prejudices, and that's what we've got to do, isn't it? We've got to go out and be ambassadors. I think it was Nicola who said, become an advocate for the scheme. And that really stuck with me. You know, you find the lady who's going to talk to everybody and say how good the intervention is. Be that person. Be the advocate for the scheme. 
be the person that helps to overcome that prejudice, work together. And I suppose the Net Zero Club is a, good, a way we can start that, is to come together and have those conversations and say directly to Connor, I've got bad vibes about the industry and you give me facts to challenge that. And it's only by sh sharing those facts, sharing those case studies, listening to people like Ranty Mike, who's going to tell us about his timber windows, which are better than UPVC, that we begin to understand. Gentlemen here at the front, Ashley, I wonder if you could provide the microphone. Thank you. I, I want to pick up on your riff, uh, which you're encouraging us to do. <clears throat> I used to work for a big publicly funded institution. I'm sure a lot of us, even the ones remaining here, also work for publicly funded bodies. Because of the austerity, because of all sorts of other reasons, um, our lords and masters are all looking at the bottom dollar. Yep. Too much. I wonder if, as lowly employees, we might write to our chief executives, our principals, our um, convener of the, uh, of, of the um, finance committee, if it's a local authority or whatever, and say, is it possible that you could get collaboration between us, our, our organization, and adjacent organizations? Because that's one thing that hasn't been talked about very much. Jamie talked about the, um, the net zero buildings, public building standard, and, and it's sort of creeping in and and I'm sure lots of them, lots of chief execs or, or whatever are kind of looking the other way, hoping it doesn't have to cost too much. But there are examples where public bodies are getting together mm. under Absolutely. community wealth building frameworks and so on to uh, achieve savings because they're collaborating at na neighbor, neighboring organizations. In the particular area uh, I'm interested in, uh, heat networks and so on, these will only work if the different public and private bodies start thinking, oh, there's a mutual benefit here. Yeah. So I just wonder, if, I also put a challenge like our chair today to everybody to see, is there a way that we can't, or we could be active, not only in our, our actual work uh, at, at whatever level, but also by advocating um, with our organization that, that they should be, what about? <clears throat> Thank you, really appreciate that. I think that's right. I think we have a duty to manage up the way as well as down, uh, and it's really important that we do that. We all have a voice, let's use it. Uh, any final questions before we, one, gentleman at the back. Hi, John Matthew here from Edinburgh Communities Climate Action Network. I just want to thank Mike for, the, for naming the elephant. I think uh, I wish this presentation had come a bit earlier in the day. Uh, in fact, some of the, the I was, uh, I'm new to this idea of, of unbodied carbon. I mean, it's not to the idea, but to the name. And uh, I think it's absolutely key indeed. There's a lot of greenwashing happening uh, on the journey to net zero and it's, um, it's absolutely capital to, to be courageous as, as governments and leaders of organization to, to, to look at that because a lot of innovations uh, could be false solutions, especially uh, when they are uh, extremely devastating um, ecological costs to that. Uh, just earlier on today, I chatted with somebody who works for a wind farm who told me about the tons of cement which is being dumped in the sea after offshore project we should normally uh, go uh, to, um, I, I'm not sure where, but uh, sh surely you shouldn't end up in the sea. Um, yeah, so I just want to, to, to thank this, uh, to, to thank Mike, and, and also I just, uh, I, I hope that this goes into, into legislation, because indeed it's a, we would uh, walk on our heads if we were not to include any measure of, of unbodied carbon into, into the solutions that we're, we're bringing. Oh, so, yeah, so thank you for that. That's helpful, thank you. And, and I'd like to thank all of our speakers who've been absolutely magnificent today. Round of applause. <laughs> Final thing for me is to say thank you to you. 
because you've sat, you've listened, you've, you've absorbed. Can I ask you a question? Could you put your hand in the air if you're going to take one thing away from today that will be useful to you in your work? Then I think our job here is possibly done. Um, thank you so much for coming here. Thank you for those who have returned. Thank you for those who are new. Um, thank you to you. Thank you to me. I was fabulous. Um, let's do this. Stop that. Thank you, Mike. Um, let's do this again. Every time we do this in Scotland, it gets bigger. It gets better. Our network grows. We make a bigger impact. We need to all run in the same direction because we know that that direction is better than what was over our shoulders, which was dire. Um, you make a difference. Thank you very much. Now go away. <laughs> Live your lives, do better, love your lots. Bye! <laughs>